I sat staring moodily into the fire. Thunder boomed overhead, lightning flashing across the midnight sky. I was hungry and hadn't eaten anything for the last three days. Food was getting scarcer and scarcer to find. Most of the shops and stores of the old world had been picked clean, and the parasites were taking its toll on the wildlife, either killing it outright or changing it into something else. It had been exactly 728 days since the onyx had arrived changing our world forever. I'd been home watching some mundane crap on TV when the first reports had come in. NASA had spotted a large mass moving at speed towards the planet. Soon after, our satellites had gone down. The Onyx ships breached our atmosphere while the world sat in stunned silence at this sudden and terrifying turn of events. The leading nations had tried to make contact course, as the visitors had yet to show any signs of aggression. But our hails had simply gone ignored as they moved freely around the planet, situating themselves over our oceans and great lakes. Soon after, their massive motherships had begun to open and the harvesting of our oceans and waterways had commenced. Again, we tried desperately to make contact, but they wanted no truck with humanity. To them, we were nothing but insects annoying flies, but flies can also bite, and so we moved against them, only to have our military wiped out and destroyed with terrifying ease. For every attack, they retaliated a thousandfold, destroying entire cities and heavily populated areas. Their strange, amorphous fighters swarmed through the skies like so many terrible locusts. The message was clear. Interfere? And die. In a last ditch attempt, a coordinated nuclear attack was staged by nations once hostile to each other. After all, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It was a catastrophic failure. The nukes were either simply shot down or redirected back towards the planet, and untold millions died in nuclear fire. But then, when it seemed all hope was lost, their great war machines and harvesters simply started to fall from the skies. And what was left of humanity began to hope, not knowing an even greater catastrophe was about to befall us. For the Onyx, as they'd come to be known, had brought something else with them. Some kind of parasitic organism. Who knows where it came from? Perhaps some long-distant planet that they had stopped to ravage somewhere along the way. Those of the Onyx who did manage to survive had gathered what was left of their technology and fled, building small keeps and citadels throughout the land. Any incursion into their territory was met with extreme violence as they cowered behind their walls, either waiting to die or perhaps hoping for some kind of reinforcements. As for what was left of humanity, we now walked through a blasted and ever-changing landscape. As the parasite warped the fauna and flora all around us, even the animals, and worst of all, some humans had changed and succumbed, their bodies twisted and grotesque living carriers of this new plague. Sighing, I stirred the fire, pulling my blanket tight around me. Tomorrow I would be nearing the coast. First, I had to traverse the blood grass that swayed like a scarlet scourge across the land. At first, I closed my eyes and tried to sleep. It was a long time coming. I awoke the next day to a smoldering campfire, dampened by a cold rain. Throwing off my blanket, I pulled off my boots, jeans, and heavy jacket before stripping all the way down to my bare ass. The forest was deadly silent, not even a bird chirped. No small creatures moved in the underbrush. Some of the trees were just starting to show the first signs of infection, their trunks crawling with strange red vines over their molding, blackened trunks. But thankfully, they were few and far between. Still, it wouldn't be long before the entire forest fell before this new and terrible blight. 
Reaching into my pack, I took out some small, moist towelettes. The colonel's bearded face smiled up at me as I tore them open and wiped myself down in the freezing rain, checking every part of my body for any cuts, scrapes, or aberrations. Nobody really knew how the infection entered the body other than a bite, of course. If one of the fallen bit you, one of those poor, mindless souls that now carried the infection, then you were finished. The infection from a bite spread rapidly, causing an intense, rabid-like behavior. I had seen it happen more than once and hoped never to see it again. Once I was satisfied, I dressed, strapping on my knife and shotgun, and drank thirstily from my canteen. The shotgun was empty, dead weight, but it had helped me bluff my way out of more than one confrontation, and I was hoping at some point to find more ammunition along the way. So for now, it stayed. Adjusting my pack, I headed to the edge of the forest, eyeing the swaying blood grass with some trepidation as I studied my map and compass. The town I was heading for was called St. Maws, a small seaside village on the coast. The only problem was there was 20 miles of blood grass between myself and the town. Walking in the grass was uncomfortable and a hard slog by day, but if I got caught after dark, the worms that squirmed in its depth by night would devour me alive. Putting away my map, I prayed to a god I no longer believed in and entered the grass. Within minutes, my bottom half was soaked to the skin in a foul-smelling crimson liquid as jelly-like throngs brushed against my jeans as if seeking a way inside. My wrist and lower arms were soon covered as I fought my way through the undulating mass. In some places, the stalks were as high as my head, dripping their crimson fluid down my back. I struggled with my head down, desperate to keep the obnoxious fluid from my face, occasionally pulling up my compass to keep my bearings. Just then, my foot came down on something hard, and with a cry, I went down, landing with a clatter on a pile of bones. A pile of bones that wore the remains of a dress. There were two of them. One female adult, a few strands of long blonde hair still attached to her ragged scalp, and a smaller skeleton. The flesh entirely stripped from its bones. It was impossible to tell the sex, but I was guessing from what was left of its tattered Thomas the Tank Engine pajamas, it had been a young boy, probably no older than five or six when he was devoured. Why in God's name she brought him here? Had they been trying to flee to the coast like myself, or had one of the fallen chased them here where they had tried to hide, all the while the night fast approaching? Something ran down my face, and I realized it was my own tears, which I scrubbed away angrily. I felt like I should do something or say something, but the dead hear no words. And so, in the end, I stepped over them and moved on, glancing at the sky knowing that almost half the day was already gone, and I still had a long way to go. Struggling on, I tried to pick up my pace, but my breathing soon became harsh and ragged, and I had to stop and rest. I wanted nothing more than to lay down to sleep, if only for a little while. It was as if the rustling of the grass was singing me a lullaby. My eyes began to feel heavy, and I wondered if this was the last thing the woman and her little boy had heard before they had succumbed. The very thought had me back on my feet, cursing and tearing at the grass as I pulled my way through. The sun was now low in the west, steadily sinking its way below the horizon. A sudden state of panic overtook me as I started running full out, my brain screaming that I had somehow got turned around and was heading back towards the center, back the way I had come. I tore off my pack and tried to look at my map, but nothing made sense. The map was soaked through with crimson liquid, its vile smell everywhere pouring down my face as I breathed it in, slicking the back of my throat. I let out a scream as the sun sank behind the horizon and the earth began to churn and twist. Still screaming, I threw down my pack as something broke the surface, something long, its snake-like body whipping back and forth and slithering shadow amongst the crimson weed that raced towards me. I could hear more rustling now coming from every direction. I sprinted, head down, jelly-like stalks whipping at my face, clinging to my arms, trying to hold me back. It was as if the blood grass itself had taken on a terrible life of its own. 
with a last Herculanean effort running on pure adrenaline, I threw myself forward and finally cleared the grass, falling on my back as a shadow reared up, letting out a cheating shriek before swiftly turning back and slithering away into the swaying darkness. I first got to my knees, both laughing and crying at the same time before managing to climb to my feet. But the world started to spin, and the roar of the ocean sounded far away as I fell back to my knees. My face hit the cool sand that I remember no more. I awoke early the next morning, the weak sunlight warming my face. With a groan, I sat up my clothes tacky and stinking where they'd stuck to my skin. Reaching down, I grabbed my canteen from my belt and upended it, managing to shake out a few meager drops. Slowly I stood and turned to face the ocean, the canteen dropping from my nerveless fingers. There was a broken construct floating above the ocean. The thing was hard to visualize. I... I can only describe it as some kind of shard-like structure that crawled with blue lightning. This vast alien edifice still sucking at the ocean, thousands of gallons drawn into its greedy maw only to come spilling out of a huge, ragged hole in its side before thundering back into the churning sea in an explosion of salt and sea spray. Dragging my eyes away from the monstrosity, I entered the freezing waters and began to wash my body and clothes, taking great handfuls of sand and scouring myself clean until my skin felt raw and tender. Finally, I came back to the beach and searched amongst the dunes, collecting ragged brambles and bits of seaweed. After some searching, I found an old Pepsi can from which I cut the top, forming a kind of makeshift cup. I soon found a place amongst the dunes out of the wind and arranged my wood pulling out my lighter, which was stained red, but still lit on the second strike. Once the brambles and smaller twigs were well alight, I added the larger pieces of wood until I had a good-sized campfire burning. Then I went off in search of food, which I soon found in the form of limpets, periwinkle, stuck to various rocks, which I collected in my tin can. I then filled the can with salt water and boiled up the whole mess greedily breaking open the shells and eating the rubbery morsels. My stomach was now somewhat sated, and my thirst was raging. I set out again, finding puddles of fresh water trapped in the higher rock formations. Eventually, I had enough to fill my little can and boiled it up, waiting in agony for it to cool enough to drink before thirstily drinking it down. I repeated this process twice more, half filling my empty canteen, by this time, my clothes were nearly dry, and I decided to move on down the coast, happy to be leaving the alien thrumming monstrosity behind. I walked for hours, my only company a lone gull that circled overhead, calling out desperately for another of its kind. It felt to me, at least, like we were the only two creatures left in the entire world. The wind was picking up now, growing stronger. Fine particles of sand stinging against my face as the light of another day grew dimmer. I had to find some shelter soon. Another night of cold and hunger would leave me with little strength to go on. I'd die here on this beach. Just another pile of bleached bones and a world already full of them. It was perhaps an hour before dark when I stumbled onto the hotel. The first sign was a sand-strewn road that led from the beach. Its surface cracked and scarred. Rusting heaps of metal that had once been cars lined its side like some lost relics of another time. Their tires flat, their paint peeling. As I moved on, I noticed some of the bonnets had been pried open. The insides left hollow and empty, completely stripped of parts. Others contained skeletons still clinging to their steering wheels. I even stopped and searched a few of the empty vehicles, but most of the glove compartments were already open, their contents scavenged long ago. Their trunks lay open like hungry mouths, with their ever-growing shadows. I carried on walking, entering the hotel's grounds through a rusted metal gate, walking slowly up a weed-strewn driveway past an overgrown lawn with rotting lawn furniture, until at last, I reached the hotel. 
The main entrance and windows were all boarded up, covered in graffiti, and I had a sinking sensation that this place was deserted long before the war, and so had remained untouched. Still, if nothing else, it would protect me against the growing wind, and many things that had once been considered of no regard before the parasite had now taken on a whole new value to the remains of mankind. Looking more closely, I noticed the wooden sheeting had already started to succumb to the salt-laden air. Managing to slip my fingers down one side of the rotting timbers, I pulled with what little strength I had left, but the boards came away easily with a squeal of rusting nails. I cast it aside, mindful of the broken glass beneath. The interior was all dusty wooden floors and peeling wallpaper. The reception area consisted of a long wooden desk topped with faded red leather. The few light fittings that remained looked like fancy cut glass or perhaps even crystal, and I had a feeling this place was quite ostentatious in its heyday. I could almost picture the laughing guests that once haunted its now darkened hallways. I looked at the stairs with its threadbare carpet and rotting handrails, before walking down the hall towards the back of the building, dust motes swirling in the fading light. I turned a corner and came to a door marked Staff, then pushed on through. Beyond was a large, rusting kitchen, most of its fittings stripped, revealing bare copper pipes and cracked floor tiles. Still, a few large cabinets remained, and I rummaged through them, finding nothing but cobwebs and ancient-looking rat turds. I turned, feeling helpless, and saw a large steel door slightly ajar. I knew this could only be a walk-in refrigerator, and hurried over, tugging the door open. To my surprise, some of the shelves were still stocked with bloated and rusting cans. Quickly, I stepped inside and began to sift through the remains. Holy shit, I grinned. It was a large can of peaches, the can dull but still completely intact. Quickly, I rushed outside and sat on the floor before drawing my knife and piercing the lid. There was no escaping the rush of gas or noxious smell, and so I cut the lid free, careful of the ragged edges. I greedily dipped my fingers inside and pulled out the succulent fruit. I gave it an experimental sniff and took a small bite. It was sweet and delicious, so I tucked in, eating greedily. When the fruit was gone, I drank the syrup. Almost instantly feeling some of my strength returning, but I was still exhausted. And so, went in search of a place to hunker down for the night. The upstairs landing was more of the same. Frayed and rotting carpet, wallpaper hanging like fleshy strips from the wall. The air stank of decay and swampy black mold. The first room I came to was stripped completely bare, as were most of the rest. But as I got further down the corridor, I finally found a room with a narrow bed and sagging mattress. The rest of the room contained some rotting furniture. The adjoining room had a cracked ceramic bath, but was missing both toilet and sink. Shrugging, I put my still damp jacket about me and settled down for the night, and was soon fast asleep. I awoke suddenly as if some kind of noise had startled me into wakefulness. Weak sunlight was pouring through the window, and the smell of the ocean seemed to be hanging heavy in the air. There it was again, a clattering and grunting from below. Quickly I shot to my feet and dragged my knife free, sleep instantly falling away as my body flooded with adrenaline. Somebody or something was downstairs, something that had come in while I had slept, and I cursed myself for a fool for not hiding the entrance that I had created last night. I could only put it down to a tired, weary mind, and I swore to myself I'd never make such a mistake again, if only I could survive the next few moments. Quickly I looked around before heading for the window. The glass was intact and thankfully not boarded over like those below. I grabbed at the sill and began to tug at it frantically, but it wouldn't budge, and I cursed seeing the nails hammered deep into the wood. The damn thing was nailed shut. I could smash the window, but that would give my position away. Besides, it was probably a 30-foot drop. If I didn't break my damn head open, it would probably at the very least break my leg. Easy prey for whatever monstrosity would find me screaming and bleeding on the floor. There was no choice. 
had to sneak downstairs and creep out the same way I'd come in. Taking a deep breath, my knife in a desperate death grip, I crept into the hallway, trying to look everywhere at once. From below came more clattering and banging and a roar of frustration, freezing my blood. Only one of the fallen could make such a horrendous noise, as if just existing caused them a terrible sort of pain. I was at the stairs now, crouching low and frozen in place. The noise had come from the back of the building, perhaps from the kitchen area I had visited earlier. I had wanted to stay and take a look around, perhaps find something that would help me along my journey, but time was up. I needed to get out, to escape before whatever now wandered these deserted halls found me and tore me to pieces. My perception narrowed as I focused on the open window. I stood and took my first step. Another ear-shattering scream came again and my nerve broke as I bolted down the stairs, running half-falling until I hit the floor. From behind me there was a loud boom as a door was thrown open, but I didn't stop or look back, but sprinted towards the window and boosted myself through. Twisting on my back, I was almost through when a hand shot out of the darkness and grabbed my ankle. I screamed, I pulled back, bracing my free leg against the wall. As I tried to escape, a head emerged, warped and covered with crimson leaking boils. Its insane eyes glared at me as its rotting teeth chomped. Its lower half was free now, revealing rotten and torn clothes covered in crimson moss. The creature let out another of those god-awful shrieks and pulled me backwards, its grip like steel as it stuffed my jean-clad leg into its mouth, biting down hard. I felt my skin pinch and I howled in pain, kicking at the thing's head over and over again. At last I managed to break free and stumble to my feet, but the thing lunged at me, sending us both crashing down to the floor. The creature was on top, its gnashing teeth lunging towards my face, desperate to tear into my flesh, but I managed to get an elbow under its throat and stabbed it repeatedly in its writhing side, its hot, diseased blood pouring over my fist. The thing reared back and howled in pain, and I brought up my knees and thrust the howling monstrosity away before leaping to my feet, my heart thumping in my chest, pounding in my ears as I leapt upon it, suddenly furious. Fucking thing, I snarled, stabbing it over and over again, my knife glancing off bone until I found its eye socket and shoving the knife home, ending the thing's wretched existence with a cruel twist of my knife. At last it lay still. Quickly I stood and tore at my jeans, knowing in my heart that I was a walking dead man. But my calf was only badly bruised. The skin thankfully still intact, painful yes, but not a walking death sentence after all. Wiping off my knife, I stumbled down the driveway, past the ruins of a dying world and back out onto the open, flowing sands. In the distance, smoke blackened the sky, and, and I walked onwards, the ocean crashing in my ears, like a harbinger of doom. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. This past year has been rough. I've been gone for quite a while trying to get things um, organized for my own life, and Patreon subscribers, you guys who subscribe everywhere, th this, this has kept me afloat in turbulent waters. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause. Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primarch, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all you guys and everybody who's included in the description down below, thank you so much for everything that you guys have done for me, and thank you so much for being here when times get difficult. 
and I can't always be around to make content. I really appreciate your support and I cannot thank you enough. And that goes to everybody who watches these videos, that goes to everybody who's subbed here, and anybody who has <laughs> ever liked a creepypasta story ever. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.